Over the past few weeks, more and more foreign journalists are expressing their anger and frustration in what they believe is a government-led crackdown on foreign press inside of China. A Times article goes on to state, after extreme flooding in central China last week destroyed homes, engulfed subways, and killed at least 73 people, the ruling Communist Party found a convenient outlet for the public's pent-up emotions, the foreign news media. Katrina Yu, an Al Jazeera reporter based inside of China states, sad sign of increasing anger and suspicion towards foreign media in China. When we filmed in front of the Zhenzhou subway, crowds were recording us and calling the authorities. This post on Weibo warns residents, don't accept interviews from foreign media. Don't be used. In today's video, I'm going to be breaking down some of the recent actions of foreign journalists inside of China and explaining why many Chinese citizens have lost trust in foreign journalists. Most importantly, I'll be providing a solution and actually what foreign journalists in China can do to improve their situation. Everybody, I want to first of all welcome you back to the channel. My name is Cyrus Jansen. I'm an American expat and entrepreneur. And if this is your first video, I invite you to hit that subscribe button and tag along as we make weekly vlogs about China and its role in society today. Now, as we start today's analysis, I'm going to show you a video that recently went viral inside of China. Let me give everybody some context into what you are seeing. This video comes from the city of Zhenzhou. The city was hit hard by devastating floods that cost the lives of hundreds of people. Pictured at the center of your screen is Matthias Berlinger, a German reporter based in China. He is surrounded by at least a dozen local Chinese residents. The Chinese group thought he was BBC reporter Robin Brandt. Notice the Chinese man grabbing his arm. People are frustrated and continue to ask him questions. The lady in the gray shirt wearing a backpack is Alice Su, a reporter with the LA Times. And she goes on to share. This is Mateus and me in the streets of Zhenzhou yesterday, where we were surrounded by an angry crowd shouting things like, this is China, get out of China. I tried to de-escalate by translating the crowd's message. Mateus is actually fluent in Chinese. Now this is the first red flag that we need to address. Mateus and Alice both claim that he is fluent in Chinese. However, when he's standing in the streets, surrounded by Chinese people who are asking him questions in Mandarin, he simply stares. He doesn't say a single word. And this leads me to believe that he ultimately has other intentions. I had to call Mateus out on this. Simple question. Why didn't you speak Chinese? Alice Su claims you are fluent, yet throughout this entire dialogue, you could only muster three words. Ni shi shi, which translates to, who are you? Why wouldn't you just explain yourself and reason with them? You can't be that naive not to understand why many Chinese are frustrated with BBC. They were literally caught in a lie last week when they color graded the trees from green to gray in an article just to pass a more negative image of China. You had a golden opportunity to explain yourself and did nothing. Now again, this is a very big red flag for me and there's only two explanations onto why Mateus chose not to speak Chinese. The first reason is simple. Perhaps he actually doesn't speak the Chinese language. And if this is true, it's actually not that uncommon. And this is a very big problem. There are a tremendous amount of foreign journalists on the ground in China who lack the basic skills to properly do their job. It is really important that when you work for one of these very large established media groups, for example, the Wall Street Journal, BBC, CNN, Washington Post, or Deutsche Welle, like Matthias does, you must actually be able to speak the language. Let me give you an example. If I was hired by the Washington Post to go to Paris, France and be their top reporter there, don't you think it would be important for me to learn the French language? How objective and truthful could I be in my reporting on local situations in France if I don't speak any French? I truly believe that it is absolutely imperative for these reporters of high established media outlets to be able to speak the local language. In fact, I think it should be a requirement. But I'm going to give Mateus the benefit of the doubt. Let's say that he actually does speak fluent Chinese. If that's the case, then this situation is actually even worse. Because if you are standing in a crowd full of angry Chinese people, they are all asking you questions, and you choose not to speak Chinese, you definitely have an ulterior motive. That evening, Mateus later goes on to Twitter and shares, the media environment in China right now is frightening. But is it really frightening for someone like him that speaks the Chinese language? Let's take a look at that video again and let's analyze what the very first thing this crowd said to Mateus. Yeah. 
<laughs> the very first thing that lady on the street says is, we are thankful that you are coming to Hunan. And Mateus responds back with a chuckle, yes, I can see that, and I'm also thankful for being here. Mateus, I have to be honest with you. The only reason you found this situation to be frightening is because you purposely tried to deceive people by not speaking Chinese. Let's take a look at a recording that you did with your cell phone. Are you a legitimate media? Are you media? Who are you? Who are you? You did not? Okay. Yeah, but you don't have a lie. You don't have the right. Again, I find it very difficult to believe that someone who speaks fluent Chinese is going to be speaking to Chinese people on the streets in English and struggling this much with the communication. It just doesn't make sense to me. When Katrina Yu stated that it was a sad sign of increasing anger and suspicion towards foreign media, I replied to this tweet and said, Honestly, can you blame the Chinese people? Look at how Western media has portrayed China over the last 18 months. Many Chinese people have been hurt. It's only natural for people to be more reserved. And just to give everybody some context on what I'm referring to, let's take a look at some of the major articles that have been published over the last 18 months and how Western media is consistently and constantly portraying China in the most negative way possible. Let's go back to March 2020 when the New York Times decided to share two articles within 20 minutes of each other about China and Italy. Notice the example on the left. When reporting about China locking down for COVID-19, the New York Times reported that it came at a great cost to people's livelihoods and their personal liberties. But here's the amazing thing. Just 20 minutes later, the New York Times shares a very similar article about the country of Italy. However, it portrays it in a much more positive way, stating that Italy is risking its economy in an effort to contain Europe's worst coronavirus outbreak. Who could forget Eva Doe from the Washington Post when she stated, China has gone into a soft form of food rationing nationwide. Everyone from Alibaba's Jack Ma to elementary students are under pressure to comply. Some restaurants switch to half portions, others issue fines. Now this article was so popular in China that many Chinese citizens and foreigners alike started to go to grocery stores, restaurants, and had to record many videos just to make sure that everybody around the world could see that China had no problem with food. Now this is an article from the BBC that was published last month. It's entitled The Foreigners in China's Disinformation Drive. I've actually done a full video on this specific article. You can click the link above if you're interested in watching that. But I want to show with you a very important screenshot from this article. This is Jason Lightfoot, a very popular British YouTuber who is based in China. Notice the image on the right. This is the original photo that he used in one of his YouTube videos. And you'll notice the color of the trees. They, of course, like most trees, are green in color. But notice what the BBC has done. They have taken this image and they have altered it to make sure that the trees appear gray. And this really just shows the desperation from some of these Western media outlets. I have a question for the BBC. If you could not accurately report the color of the trees in China, how can we trust you with bigger things? Honestly, I feel like I'm disciplining my five-year-old daughter. Honey, if I can't trust you with small things, how am I going to trust you with the larger ones in life? Now, these past couple of weeks, most of us have been enjoying the Summer Olympics in Tokyo, Japan. But of course, this was also an opportunity for Western media to further attack the country of China. Let's take a look at some examples from these Olympics. This is an Australian report that talks about the 14-year-old diver that won gold medal for China at the recent Summer Olympics. Viewers were shocked that teen diving sensation didn't show any signs of happiness. This is the most ridiculous thing I've seen. You're taking a photo of a diver at the top of a 10 meter platform. No diver in the world is smiling before they are getting ready to do a dive. You are mentally preparing yourself. This was a terrible article. And again, it just shows you the bias that is intended. They want you to believe that this poor 14-year-old girl is not allowed to smile. She must have been trained in some camp in China and that she cannot show any emotion at the Olympic Games. Meanwhile, all you have to do is look directly after she finishes her dive to see if she smiles or not. Why don't the authors of the article use this picture after she immediately gets out of the pool? Or maybe this photo of her standing with her coach. 
or maybe the photo of her coach lifting her up when she at 14 years old becomes an Olympic champion and wins a gold medal. Sean Ryan, an American who lives in Shanghai, China, goes on to state, when U.S. sports stars like Olympians and NBA players say they're trying to earn money to take care of their impoverished families, U.S. media calls them heroes. But when a gold-winning Chinese Olympic diver says she wants to take care of her mother, the U.S. media narrative is evil Chinese government. Now let's take a look at how the New York Times portrays both American and Chinese gymnast. This is what the New York Times wrote about Suni Lee, the American who won the Olympic all-around gymnastic champion. She wasn't just training for herself. She went to the gym every day. All the first-generation Americans want to achieve success, grueling practices, and painful injuries. But now let's take a look at how the New York Times describes a Chinese gymnast. They're churning out gold medals for the glory of the nation. Chinese public is increasingly wary of the sacrifices. There's no mass appeal in China. The girls are funneled into a system. They have no idea, and their duty is to the nation, not to themselves. This is the reality of becoming a gold medal champion in gymnastics. It doesn't matter if you're from the United States or you're from China. These girls are starting at a remarkably young age. They are training their entire childhood and young adult life to become an Olympic champion. This is what Olympic athletes do. It is no difference for people in America or in China. They are all making tremendous amount of sacrifices. But again, we can see the bias. In America, we're always being portrayed as heroes. But in China, we're being portrayed as slaves to the system. Now, some of you might be thinking, Cyrus, you're really looking at the smallest details and trying to say that Western media is being biased against China. But really, when you take all of these small parts and you add them up together, you can see why it's very difficult for Westerners around the world to truly have an objective view about the country of China. Now, as we come to the end of today's video, I'm going to leave you with a very powerful comment that was left on that New York Times article. To understand why these Chinese people are angry at Western media, one needs to examine their arguments before dismissing it purely as the result of government propaganda. For anybody who has been following Western media coverage of China, it is clear that there is a strong negative bias and everything is viewed through the political lens. It's the same with the recent flood coverage. Just compare the coverage of the flood in Germany and the flood in Zhengzhou. It will become clear. Instead of being self-critical and seeing the failings of Western media that has contributed to the worsening relations between China and the West, the author just piles on the same anti-China narrative and focused on the worst aspects one can find, while ignoring the fact that there have been calls for reason from official media, including the chief editor Hu Xijin of what is considered the nationalistic tabloid, The Global Times. Now again, we're going to end today's video right back where we started, talking about the floods in Zhengzhou. Many Chinese citizens actually went online on their favorite social media platforms and were calling for an outcry. They wanted to know the reason behind these floods. Obviously, there was a substantial amount of rainfall, but was there some mismanagement from the local government in Zhengzhou? Actually, if you're able to read and speak the Chinese language, you can go into the Baidu search engine, and when you type in Zhengzhou, Hongshui, which means the flood in Zhengzhou, one of the top results is Zhengzhou Hongshui Yuan, which translates to the reason for the Zhengzhou floods. Again, people are actively searching, discussing, and simply talking about the reason for the floods in China. But again, you're not going to be able to find these results on Google. You're going to have to be able to speak Chinese to truly understand what the Chinese people are discussing. The hashtag Zhengzhou Hongshui Yuan was trending on Weibo, Douyin, all over the country of China. People were actively discussing this. And this is what we see on social media websites all throughout China. Whatever the issue is in China, it is often discussed on these social media platforms. As somebody originally from China, the author of this New York Times article could have been the bridge that improves understanding between people in China and the United States by giving a more balanced coverage that informs the public. Instead, these coverage have only increased the gulf and fueled animosity on both sides. 
Now, my advice to foreign journalists in China is very simple. Be fair, be objective, and take time to reason with the local Chinese people. If you're able to speak the Chinese language, start talking to these local people and genuinely listen to their feelings, their concerns, and what they actually feel about. Earlier last year, when Chinese people came out and stated that they were very happy with the way the Chinese government you know, handled the COVID-19 situation, foreign journalists immediately reported, these people are brainwashed. But look at how China has responded to COVID-19. It has had the best response in the world to COVID-19. I've talked to dozens upon dozens of foreigners and Chinese people living in China. All of them have been enjoying a very high quality of life over the past 10 months as COVID has been relatively controlled. Now, recently, the Delta variant has begun to spread through China. And again, there are some people that are literally hoping that this Delta variant spreads throughout China, kills a large amount of people, just so it could potentially weaken the Communist Party of China. The author of this article is, of course, Gordon Chang, who is one of the most anti-China people on the world today. But again, let's have a look at what China's done these past 12 months. They've done a good job controlling COVID-19. I have no doubt that the people of China will be able to work together with their government and make sure that they control this Delta variant. I'm going to leave you with one last tweet. This is from Eric Fish when he shares, I'm remembering the 2012 Ningbo protest against a petrochemical plant when locals were so happy to see foreign reporters because Chinese media couldn't report on it. Protesters even helped hoist one up so he could get a better camera angle. Chinese people have always enjoyed having foreigners inside their country, as long as they're fair, objective, and take time to understand the local Chinese culture. Everybody, I want to thank you so much for making it to this point in the video. Again, if this is your first video, I invite you to hit that subscribe button. And if you're interested in being a part of this team and financially supporting our mission here on YouTube, I'd love to invite you to join our Patreon page. We have a growing community there, a Discord chat room where all of us can chat together and share ideas. I'd love for you to be a part of that community. Everyone, I thank you so much for being here with me today. And I look forward to seeing you all in a future video.